welcome to the course International Studies in Vernacular Architecture. Today we are going to talk about the transformations that take place in vernacular context. In all these lectures we have come across various aspects of how change happens and how people and places evolve uh, together and how all these changes can be seen in their places. So how do we really understand this transformation of either a building or a landscape or a particular place? Let me uh, give you a simple examples of starting from a building uh, scale. So in the Thai cultures, especially the 13th century, you can find the Lana house and how their characters and how their spatial characteristics have evolved in time especially with the modern demands and the westernization process and how their spatial orientations have gradually changed. In the Lana house you have these the traditional the typical format is the kitchen and there's a small terrace to do their domestic activities and a veranda and you have these two rooms with a simple corridor. But whereas in the Thai house you have this central terrace here and all the rooms and the kitchen are oriented around it. If one has to really understand the traditional house, how it has changed gradually over generations. So one is looking at the time factor. For example, we have this 13th century post Thai centuries, which is referred as Ruyun Thai, which is actually built uh, with a uh, portable processes because of the flood nature, nature of the condition, flood conditions there and how they raise these houses with the stills and which could be easily dismantled and which could be easily transportable to some other place and the, even the materiality how they use is you know mostly of the uh, either the timber or any other lightweight materials which they used to use. But whereas uh, in the recent uh, centuries, whereas early 19th and 20th centuries, there are you can observe actually there are six major transformations have formed. So earlier you can see that this was um, two dwellings and there is a central uh, court, but now this central terrace uh, it has converted into the hall, and there is a multi level to the flat floors and. Earlier, this was meant only for the kind of flood water to come over and uh, you know, uh, there are other domestic purposes. But now with the invention of the automobile and people started using the automobiles. So that is where they started using for the parking purposes. And there are certain changes of an area under a raised dwelling because they are getting these modern equipments or the modern automobiles which they need to park somewhere. So similarly in this process there is a disappearance of the veranda and erection of a porch in front. You know, so that is how and a bathroom at upper level and a kitchen unit to so cooking space. So these are the some few modifications which has happened. So and similarly in the uh, in the last decades, you can see that you know these the obvious features of these traditional roofs at the upper level and the contemporary building at the ground floor. So they started using this particular raised level and they started making this as a kind of permanent structure. You know the, the, that is how the changes have been uh, made to these traditional Thai houses. So uh, this is one process. One can really understand how a typical dwelling unit have been transformed uh, in various phases and what are the uh, driving factors associated to it, whether it is a technology, whether it is a climate, whether it is a demographics, the population size or the household sizes have increased or their needs, the day-to-day -day needs have changed. So this is how, but it is all depicted in the built form compositions. So today whatever we are seeing here in these, so it is almost like any other house, any modern house, uh, what you see in any part of uh, the Asian countries, you have the whole, there is no stilt have completely disappeared and now it is mostly meant with the, uh, a regular house, of course with the conical structure. So this is how the reproduction of this Thai house uh, which was done by a local villagers. And when we talk about uh, you know, the buildings, these buildings can be studied in two different ways. 
One is, as discussed earlier in the Thai house, by tracking the chronological development. You know, so how in the 13th century, how it was in the late 2000, how it was, and in the last decade, how. So there are various drivers which are associated to it. But uh, let me also show you certain examples of when in our uh, interaction with various studies. So, for example, we were conducting some study with some students in uh, Madhya Pradesh and uh, near Amarkantak area in the Chhattisgarh and Amarkantak um, ranges. We visited some villages, Kionchi and other places. So, here we can see there's a Beel tribe uh, who lives there and is one of the dominant tribe in that particular area. And uh, you can see these traditional uh, patterns, they're all built with the rammed earth constrictions. You know, they're all use the local uh, techniques and uh, their house forms are designed in such a way which actually suits to their uh, climatic needs and their forest livelihoods, you know. So, and even we can see, notice that, you know, there's a kind of color, black color, which they apply to their, to their dwellings. And let me uh, tell you what kind of uh, associations uh, you know they have interacted with with the upcoming development agencies so now the some with some government initiatives uh, they have given uh, certain schemes how we can renovate these houses or how we can expand these houses with certain investment on it or certain partnership orientation so in that way maybe you know so some of them they, uh, they have given certain support in constructing an extension part of it. So for instance, this building here, what you are actually seeing is a kind of toilet which they have provided. But till now, uh, you will not notice that there is, they're not using, they're not using it as a toilet, you know. So, uh, there are various reasons associated. Maybe they are not still accepting that process or uh, because they are getting something as a support, they built it, but they are not sure what to do, you know. So in that way, and uh, you can see in many of these houses, there were all, uh, whichever the house we went, there is a small unit which was made like that. And either it is just used as a store or just lying there. And this is where I think the development agencies have to rethink about, you know, uh, the cultural background and how they really adapt to these situations, how you can actually make them encourage and understand you know, what is the purpose of uh, the hygiene situations and, you know, so there is always uh, some gap we can really notice. In the similar uh, context, you can see that, you know, there are some OM symbols. So we asked uh, almost every house, even here you can see that there is an OM symbol which was painted. And the villagers asked, are you Hindus or, you know, uh, why every house has a home symbol. They said, no, our God is different. We, we pray different gods. But then there was some myth which has been spread out in the community saying that, you know, there is some evil spirits were going around in the village. And then the next day, what they said, some agency have come up and they painted this particular thing in front of every house, you know. So was it really an evil spirit or people, you know, that's to do with the belief systems, what they believed. And then some have a different agency have come up and they try to put these symbols on each and every house. So uh, in a way, it is a kind of manipulation of certain things. You know, this could be a story which has been or a rumor uh, which has been spread out before this, the decoration has been done and people started afraid of, and you know, this is one way of convincing, okay, you just mark these things in front of it. So in that way, we can really see, you know, what is something not acceptable and what is acceptable uh, to these communities, you know, and uh, how, how so there are certain things which are forced with them and there are certain things which uh, they resist to it. You know, so these are a few examples. And similarly, I think uh, in the next uh, uh, in the next unit, we'll be also discussing about some examples of, especially during the disaster, how co-dwelling units are provided by the beneficiaries. And, you know, when the NGOs or the development agencies, when they provide for the disaster victims, you know, so in a span of eight to 10 years, one can actually see that, you know, how they brought back into uh, their uh, traditional formats, you know, how they respond to this and how they modify it, you know, having a porch in front of it and putting their bright colors 
and again looking at uh, growing the trees around it in the next 10 years when I visited the same place I could see the certain traditions which were brought back after the disasters, the forms which were brought back and at the same time they started adapting to certain concrete forms, brick and concrete forms you know. So in that way there is always a process of how they can adapt slowly and how there are processes which they have resisted also. When we look about to study how these buildings, how these dwellings have been transformed, we can also look at from uh, from whose point of view, from a specific point of view, how we are able to study these buildings. The, if you look at it, you know, an agency which have done these, uh, you know, markings, they had a different perception and a development approach which looked at the toilets and extensions, they had a different approach. And the communities, how they responded, they have a different perceptions. There is always uh, different opinions and different reactions to the development process. Till now, we talked about the dwelling aspects. I mean, these are only a few examples, but there are many we can uh, bring into the discussions. And now we come to the transforming streets and precincts. So I'm going to talk to you about a case in Mahabaleshwar in, um, near Pune in Maharashtra. And uh, this is uh, a place where, which is, uh, it's, it's a kind of sacred place which is referred to the birthplace of River Krishna. And uh, of course, there's the hills, the, all the mountain regions, and we can actually notice that there is the Panchaganga Mandir, and which inside you have these uh, people believe that this is where the birth point of the Krishna, um, you know, lies with. And uh, since uh, historically, this particular place is known as the Kshetra Mahabaleshwar and because that is where the birthplace of the Krishna has been originated. And they have these historic uh, temples, archaeological temples which are still in a ruined conditions and some of them are living temples which people do visit even every day. So, uh, so many of them uh, until the British have arrived to this place. So this particular place is known for this kind of sacred uh, processes. and. Today, what we actually see with the advent of tourism coming to visit these sacred places and you can see that, you know, the shops, whether it is selling the goods for the worship process, worship or any other items or any other um, juice centers or any fancy shops, you can see that, you know, all this, of course, there were Earlier also, you can see some evidences, there was some, there's a raised plinth along the walls so that, you know, people used to sell coconuts and other things. But today you can see that many of these shops, they hinder the whole um, religious context of this particular place. Besides this, you have these religious temples, but no one can even see from this small space, you know, there's a behind, there's a big temple, but the whole facade is covered with the um, you know, with these uh, either encroachments or uh, some of them, they have uh, legally taken certain uh, permission to keep these stalls for on a lease or, you know, some, uh, or for some time. So, uh, now, with this, um, the, the modern tourists coming in and then, you know, the, their needs, their wants, then, you know, it has nothing to do with much of the religion, but you know, but that whole character has been addressed to a, a tourist needs, you know, and similarly, the newer Mahabaleshwar town, uh, where you actually see the colonial uh, impressions and col the Britishers have set up this place and it's just about four to five kilometers from the Kshetra Mahabaleshwar. And even till today, uh, there are still some of these colonial buildings which are evident in this particular town. And especially the Malcompate Street, you know, the whole bazaar, the Malcompate Bazaar. So that time the, the British officer Malcolm, the governor, who actually ruled this place and who have administered this place and it was named after him. And this particular high street is also referred as a, one of the heritage present. And uh, this particular study has been done in collaboration with the Sinhagat College of Architecture Pune and IIT Roorkee with the cooperation from the faculty, Dr. Vaishali Latkar and uh, Purva and others. So 
we team of uh, students from here and they supported with all the contacts and the context of that particular place and it was uh, uh, a study which we have conducted there to study how the heritage character and how these colonial characters are now dominant with these uh, newer setups. So, for example, if you see these are the same uh, photograph of the same building, you know, so there's um, a library and the tourist information center, you know, so this is what you see from inside the gym. But the moment you enter into this particular town, no one standing at this height will not be able to see anything what is there, whether it is a tourist information center, whether it is um, a library, is a colonial times, belonging to the colonial times. So no one is able to see because of these encroachments, you know. Yes, there are other communities which have set up and the municipality have given some provision for them to conduct certain economic activities. But you also have to understand the whole visual character to this particular place has also been obstructed. So there is always a process that how we can interface with this, uh, the economic uh, feasibilities and as well as the cultural uh, factors, you know, how they have to interface and how these have, both has to negotiate. It is very difficult, at least in Indian context, it's very difficult to take them out because there's a lot of processes involved in it. There is could be some resistance coming from the communities or various other political uh, authorities. You know, so it is always a challenging process how we really have to negotiate to create a space for both for the economic factors and as well as for the historic, you know, the cultural continuity to uh, take place. I think this is where we are standing outside in the Malcolm Pate Street and, and this is where exactly the building is, but no one is able to see that particular street. So from the inside, if you see the, the eye line, you know, from the inside of this building premises, you will actually see all these, uh, you know, the small boxes uh, of shops which are aligned. So if, even from outside, no one will be able to see inside and from inside, you don't see what is happening outside. So there is always the urban design concerns makes an important role because uh, how the visual permeability could be maintained. So similarly, uh, earlier these, uh, when the Britishers have arrived uh, and they started building as a, as a kind of uh, summer stays and so people uh, migrated to these places in order to serve them, you know, it could be uh, butlers, it could be uh, people running shops for them, people running clubs for them and also the shoemaking industry have shifted because they use uh, these uh, shoes, especially the officers. But today none of these exist, you know, so they all uh, after the post-independence, many changes have happened. So once upon a time, known for this kind of colonial setup, but today what you can see is a kind of simple street with you know the markets, what you find in any of the plain lands. For example, you have the fruit shops, you have the uh, game zones, you have uh, cloth stoves, you know, all what we find in any other place. And hoardings is also one aspect because once if you are talking in the context of uh, traditional architecture or the vernacular architecture and how it is relevant with the tourism industry, you know, why do people come to Mahabaleshwar? Is it not just staying in a lodge and going back, you know, it's not only just because of the climate they're coming. So what, what does this place offer to them, you know, so that is very important. So is it something to do with the built environment, is it something that they can't find in their plains where they are coming from or their urban centers where they are coming from. So how do we really have to negotiate these things with the changing environment? Like there are a few cottages or the few bungalows which are abandoned. For example, this one is actually the Malcolm's house and which is in a very abandoned situations. And uh, so like that, there are many uh, we visited uh, many of these traditional houses which were built during the colonial times and uh, many of them are in a dilapidated conditions and except their owners stay somewhere else, maybe many of these have actually uh, been bought by some industrialist or maybe they are living some elsewhere and no one is taking care of certain buildings and some of them do take care, maybe visit once in a year or so, so like that. So the, the, these traditional buildings are uh, completely overlooked and they really deserve a proper conservation approach. 
So some of the good examples which we can see is that of course uh, there are some uh, agencies which came forward and uh, in order to promote tourism they started uh, purchasing these uh, bungalows and they started conserving these and converting them as a heritage um, you know uh, the heritage resorts or any other uh, lodges and sometimes like this is one of the places which was under when we went it was under the construction process so here the architects play an important role choosing the local materials choosing the existing materials and uh, so that in that way the heritage is maintained so certain things are restored certain things are uh, reconstructed and they have modified uh, certain elements so uh, there is one more lodge uh, very close to the high street so this is how the manufactured heritage because you know if you really want to uh, bring the tourism into that small towns you know why do people go to these particular uh, towns you know so they need to uh, spend some time and how does this place really provide an opportunity for them. So similarly now if you look at these transformations how the streets have transformed once the whole street section itself have changed once it has a wide street and now today uh, we can see they have been encroached and the whole, most of the shops have been taken over and even the, the of course the chowks remain but the elements have uh, change the now earlier the display of the elements was very different and now the usage of these roundabouts now you can see earlier the local the strawberry stalls or you know uh, of course they were also brought by British but now you can see the uh, any other ice cream shops or the uh, this cosmetics or the game zones so almost uh, the purpose of this particular street, uh, the commercial activities, that is what the tourists are also preferring for. But whereas once it was a Christian dominant society, today hardly 15 to 16 uh, families live in that particular Mahabaleshwar who uses this uh, old historic church. You know, so even uh, surviving these old buildings is also becoming a challenge. And people were celebrating the Holika. Uh, the Han, it was a holy festival and you know it's like that you can see within these high streets there's a lot of mixed cultures that take place over and uh, what we can really understand from this example the shift from once it was a dominant culture the Christianity and now today uh, you know uh, very few people live there and even to survive these traditional buildings it is becoming a challenge but once upon a time these were the power places where the governors and the military officers used to live in these bungalows but today they are all abandoned and the how the investment agencies come forward to modify them and manufacture a new form for it and uh, you know produce new meanings associated to it on a similar context you can see that you know the pratapgarh fort uh, which is again uh, uh, dating back to the shivaji uh, maharaj period and you can see that um, even this historic fort, on the top of this fort, one can actually notice that people have occupied these houses. You know, the whole settlement um, is there on the top of the fort. So, because it was not coming under official agencies, you know, so in that way, there's no control over this. So, in fact, a lot of potential, especially these examples showcase that there is a lot of potential that how we can attract the tourism at the same time, how we can produce uh, the local cultural economies as well. So all these uh, understandings, so students have taken it to the municipal authorities and they displayed their findings as a part of the civic design processes and they really deliberated with the local, they invited the local communities, the officials, the hoteliers who are actually the main stakeholders of this particular place. And uh, interestingly, many of them have participated and they really uh, given a good inputs of, yes, what we think have some relevance. And they also given some serious other in, uh, certain inputs which have helped our students to think further in a more realistic manner. So we talked about a dwelling, a building level, we talked about a street, and now we talk about a scope of a city. You know, like the photographs which you are seeing uh, from the works of uh, Florian Weidman and uh, Shirov Salama, uh, where is, 
a place called Doha, you know, in the Middle East. In 1950s, it is a, a very small settlement and some of the fishing communities uh, do settle there and you can see the uh, Arab population, how they are settled in these traditional houses. And of course, the, all these desert communities, their architecture is known with uh, a response to the climatic conditions, the hot and uh, the, the dry com uh, desert climatic conditions. So uh, even today, these the historic sauks do exist, but if you see uh, in the 1930s, the population has dropped from 27,000 to the 16,000 because of the invention of the cultured pearls in Japan. So these are all referred to the pre-oil settlements. But whereas in 1947 and 1971, where the oil, uh, you know, oil industry have boomed and almost 67% uh, of the foreign migration migrants have uh, come over here in terms of the business affairs. So in, uh, in 1974, the, that is the first time the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Agriculture and its town planning section has been established. And similarly to expand the cities with a regulated framework, the Ministry of Public Works Department and as a British consultant, uh, uh, Levelyn Davis was appointed to design the first master plan of Doha. So you can see that a small city have now expanded uh, connecting the ring routes and especially even the shallow water body that has been now converted as a diplomatic quarters. So uh, once with the here what we can actually see is the whole city has transformed a small traditional settlement which has uh, a fisher, you know, uh, a, a fishermen's or some traders living over there, and now it has expanded in a span of 50 years in an un unimaginable way. Like uh, so, here they started with these Qatar University, the university section. They started an airport here so that the migration, the, the foreign migration, have set up their own ventures in the Middle East and. Uh, ring road connectivity systems were established. So here the old Qatari neighborhoods were replaced and indigenous population. So the people who were living here, they started moving away so that they start selling out and they started moving into the newer houses on the suburbs and uh, the uh, suburban neighborhoods. So until 1970s, uh, the charge of the subdividing land into parcels and Ministry of uh, Labor and Social Affairs as well as Ministry of Public Works, they were taking care of this whole process. And again, certain consultants, American consultants were at, but today, what we actually see here is, you know, almost the shallow water part is completely now a new uh, township and you have these the traditional uh, south and you have this airport city. And at the same time, uh, if you look at it, the development of this uh, towards Al Riyan and as well as uh, towards the Dukan where the petroleum reserves and the connectivity of the network has been developed. And again, the education cities have been developed and in that way, a major transformation, especially in these cities, have been noticed. But now, the today what you see 50 years before, 70 years before was a simple city with a traditional building. So today what we see is a Doha is very modern and the skyscrapers living there. But now the challenge is, uh, how to continue these cultures, you know. So that is where now Doha is actually taking forward about how really we have to decentralize our economies. How can we rely only on the petroleum industries, how uh, oil and gas industries, but how can we decentralize whether in terms of sports industry, in terms of cultural. So they started working on, uh, you know, setting up these cultural institutions and so that, you know, different cultures come here and how they actually uh, collaborate with these spaces. So in that way, even at a large planning level also, culture plays an important role. But one with this particular case, what we really see is, you know, the authors, uh, uh, Florian Weidman, how they really related with this production of space is the first uh, settlement which we see from 1800s is referred as a very vernacular uh, space. And uh, that is how the pre-oil settlements used to be there. But when the oil production have started, uh, you know, so and that is where 
the abstract space, you know, the new things have coming in. So this is, the first one is referred as an absolute space and the abstract space. And in 1970s, the post-liberalization process and the state independence, how um, uh, the conflicted space and the differential space, because now they need to diversify certain economies. They can't rely only on one singular economy. But they realized that, you know, that we need to really diversify in different sectors so that we can be self-sustained in a longer run. So in that way, uh, this Qatar National Development Strategy is the first five-year strategy which looked at uh, various policies that can be integrated together. So with this, uh, we conclude a session on the transformations. So I hope you all understood right, like how various drivers, it is not only about uh, the change in the built forms and we can also see a very drastic changes in our whole planning process and the whole cityscape will be uh, has been modified and this is just a true in case of Qatar but uh, in any city we can see but how cultures uh, struggle with this process and how they negotiate is a very relevant aspect thank you